All right, so this video is an introduction to topology and the topic of compactness. And I'm gonna introduce everything from scratch and give you a rigorous mathematical proof of the following theorem, which is really beautiful, that the set consisting of zero and all the numbers of the form one over n, where n varies over all natural numbers. So one half, one third, one fourth, one fifth, etc., together with zero is a compact set. So I'm gonna explain what that means and give you the proof, and this is so beautiful. You're gonna love this video. And I've, just to tell you a story about this is, this is one of my favorite exercises in topology, because when I was first learning topology, I was around 12 years old, and I was reading Rudin's Principles of Mathematical Analysis, and this exercise came at the end of the chapter. And I just studied compactness, I studied all these advanced theorems with compactness, like the Heinborel theorem, but I didn't really feel for it. And I remember looking at this exercise, you know, and. I try to think about it. I remember I thought about it for maybe like a day or during a day. And eventually I got the idea. It was so simple. And that's when compactness really made sense to me. So I hope that watching this video is going to really make sense to you if you're still kind of digesting this concept. So let's dive into it. So first of all, what does compactness even mean? Okay, we are, we're just going to get into that first of all. And you know, you can also skip this part if you already know and you want to get to the proof, but I'm just going to give you a summary. It's going to give you an intuition for what it means. Okay, so let's dive into that. So the summary is going to be that a set is compact. So I'm going to write this out as a definition. So here's a definition. And we're looking at subsets of the real numbers. Okay, so we're going to say that a set S contained in, in R, is a subset of the real numbers, is compact. Okay, so this is the definition of compactness. Um, if the following condition is satisfied. Okay, I'm going to define the condition. So if the following condition is satisfied is if every open cover of S has a finite subcover. And I'm going to explain what that means too, but I'm going to first write this out. And this video is so powerful because you're just going to understand all these advanced concepts in just one quick video. Okay, so every open cover is a finite subcover. What is an open cover? What does that mean? Okay, so first point is that an open subset of R. Okay, so we say that U contained in R is open. If every element in U has a wiggle room that's also contained in U. So I'm being imprecise here, but just want to tell you the definition. So you have the number line. For example, if you take an open interval in the number line, if you take any point inside the open interval, so it's not included, the boundary points are not included. So for example, suppose you have A comma B, okay? So you take a point inside, it's not in the boundary, it's inside U. Then there's always going to be a wiggle room. There's always going to be some wiggle room epsilon. So if you take the point C, C minus epsilon all the way to C plus epsilon is going to be contained inside our open interval U, right? Now if C approaches B, if C is very close to B, the wiggle room is smaller. The epsilon will be smaller than if C is in the middle, for example, okay? So, but we can always choose a sufficiently small epsilon. So this interval C minus epsilon, C plus epsilon is contained in U, okay? That's what open means. As an example of something that's not open is if we modified, instead of having an open interval, if we had a half open interval, half closed interval, or a closed interval, something like this, which included the boundary point A, it would not be open because this point A inside U doesn't have a wiggle room in at least one side, doesn't have a wiggle room to the left, for example, right? So there's no open interval containing A, there's no epsilon, so that A minus epsilon, A plus epsilon is entirely contained in U, because if you move any direction, any amount to the left, you're no longer in U. So this is what an open set is, and so we have an open set, so we can write this out precisely, so, so if every X in U, there exists epsilon greater than zero, such that the following is satisfied, and what the following is, is that x minus epsilon comma x plus epsilon is also contained in U, okay? So there's an epsilon neighborhood of x, okay? That's what we call it, and it's contained in U. So it's always a wiggle room. And generally, open subsets of the line, you can actually prove this. It's just gonna be a union of intervals, okay? So um, a union of open intervals. So actually, these are basically the only ones, okay? So, but we don't need that in this video. We have open, and what is an open open cover of, of a set? Okay, so let's write it out here. So an open cover, so again, you know, if you if you already know open covers, you can skip ahead, but I hope that this will give you a lot of insight, even if you do know it. Um, an open cover is going to be, for S, is basically if you take S, okay, contained in R, an open cover is a family of open sets, okay? So it's a family of open sets which we index as such, U alpha, alpha in A. What does this mean? It's an abstract notation. It just means it's a bunch of open sets. It could be un, n varies from one to infinity. Okay, so in that case, a is a natural number. So it could be un, 
n varies from 1 to infinity, but we don't want to necessarily say it's just indexed by the natural numbers because we want to consider all kinds of weird situations that appear in later topology if you keep studying it. So we index it by a set A, just some family, some bunch of open, of open sets so that S is contained, so such that S is contained inside the union of all the U alphas as alpha is in A. What that means is that every element of S is in one of these sets in the cover. Hence, it's called a cover. Okay, so S is this set, you have a bunch of open sets, and every element of S is in one of the open sets. Could be in more than one, but it's in one at least. That's what's an open cover. Okay, so for example, I could have like, if I have in the number line, I have zero and one, then I could write down an open cover. I'm just going to write, give you one example. Um, the open cover could be just a bunch of open sets that covers this, this interval. So I could do, do something like this, okay? So you can see here, like I've done three open intervals, this one, this one, and this one, okay? So three open intervals containing the closed interval zero, one. That's an open cover of zero, one. Now, the question, compactness means that every open cover is a finite subcover. So basically, if I give you an open cover that it's, it could be infinite, um, so that every element of S is in one of the sets in the cover, you can actually extract a finite number of sets in the cover. So every open, every element is in one of those sets. Okay, one of those finite number of sets. Okay, so you can find a finite subcover of every open cover. So an open cover could be infinite. You may be, you know, in this example we had three open intervals, but you may be able to cover some S with a very large number of open intervals. You may have this really little, little like tiny, tiny open intervals getting smaller and smaller. And it looks like you need infinitely many to kind of cover some subset of the, of the number line. But then we're saying that actually we can just choose a finite number always. Doesn't matter what we start off with, what open cover we start off with, we can always choose a finite number so that every element in S is in one of those finite number of open sets in the cover. And that's what a finite subcover is, okay? So to give you an example of something that is not compact, which is probably illustrative before we get to compactness, is if we talk about the real numbers. So here you have the real numbers R, it's not compact. Compactness should be thought of, it seems very abstract, but all it's actually gonna do is basically tell us the extreme value theorem is true. That any continuous function on the set is actually bounded and attains its maximum value on the set. Okay, so if you take the number line, you know, it's not true. Continuous functions don't have to be bounded, don't have to attain their maximum value on R, um, but on a closed interval, they have to be. So closed intervals are compact. R is not compact, but why is it in this definition? We have to actually explain that definition. Is you define an open cover, un consists of minus n comma n. Okay, now this is like going to be indexed by the natural numbers, n varies from one to infinity. And here you basically see that every number, every real number is going to be in minus n comma n for some n, right? If you take n really large, you'll, you'll get every real number eventually, fix a real number, You'll be in UN for some n. So UNs form an open cover of the real numbers, but there is no finite subcover. Okay, and the way you'd rigorously prove this, I won't get into it in this video, but I'll give you the outline, is any finite number of the UNs, you choose the maximum n out of that finite collection. Because it's finite, there's a maximum. And that maximum n, let's call that k, that UK is going to be the union of all the sets in the finite subcover, alleged finite subcover, and of course that doesn't cover all the number lines. So the real line, the real numbers are not compact because there is no finite subcover of this open cover. But we'll prove this set is compact, and it's it's really cool just to say that no matter what open cover I give you, you can find a finite subcover. So how are we going to do that? So let's just dive into that proof, and I'm going to do it on this side of the board. So once you've got there, and feel free to ask me questions. If you're enjoying my content, please don't forget to leave a like and subscribe. It makes a huge difference to my channel. I love doing math at all levels, from beginning algebra all the way to this kind of math. So it's for everyone, and the more people start watching, the more they'll start going to watch more and more videos in different kinds of math. And my goal is to change lives through math education, help as many people as possible. So you know, please consider sharing with people if you know people that would benefit from these videos as well. But let's get into the proof now. All right, so let's now prove the theorem and you're gonna love this proof. So we're gonna get into the proof. So what's the proof, okay? And while I do the proof, I'll motivate it as well, okay? What's the idea behind the proof? So let, let's consider an open cover of zero and one over n, okay? So let that u alpha where alpha is in a, and you know, if this seems intimidating, we're just getting used to it, okay? So don't worry about that. We're just getting used to the notation that u alpha alpha in A, 
be an open cover of our set S, okay? So be an open cover of our set. So let's call our set S here, okay? So let, let's this, let this be an open cover of S. And we know, of course, S is just, this is going to help us to understand it. S is basically 0, 1, 1 half, 1 third, 1 fourth, all the way up to et cetera, et cetera, okay? So all the numbers of, of that form. Now, what's interesting, what's very interesting here is that S is very close to being not compact, okay? And that's actually going to give us an insight into the proof. So open cover of S, we want to show it as a finite subcover. But if you just deleted zero, okay? And this is going to be very crucial. If you delete zero and you just consider the set T, which just is one half, one third, et cetera, this set is actually not compact. Now, I know I haven't proven this, but as I said, the intuition is to think about is, is every continuous function on the set, does it have attain a maximum and a minimum? And actually on this set T, the function y equals one over x does not attain any maximum. It's unbounded on T, okay? So that's, that's where we sort of see T is not compact, but what about the open cover definition, okay? So let's kind of think about that. Well, if you think about T, okay, it just consists on the number line, one, half, one third, um, one fourth, etc. You know what you can do is you can actually find an open cover that has no finite subcover, and you can just take this little open interval containing one, this little open interval containing half. They're going to get smaller and smaller, okay? Because the gaps are going to get narrower as you get one third, one fourth, one fifth, all the way up to one over a million. But you just go on taking these open intervals, and what you can do is, and you know you have all these intervals. What you can do is you can see that those open intervals, the totality of them is an open cover because every element of T, I've not included zero here, but every element of T is going to be in one of them. But there is no finite subcover because if you even delete one open interval, one of, one of them from, from your cover, it's no longer going to be a cover because every number, everything in T is contained in exactly one interval, exactly one of the open sets in our cover. So there cannot be a finite subcover. And so this shows that T is not compact. But then our thing we want to prove is that S is compact. And this is why it's so beautiful. Once you realize that in math, you realize a closed situation where something doesn't work, it narrows down what you have to look for. And now we understand that zero is going to play a role. Okay, assuming we know this. Okay, so when I was doing that exercise in Rudin, I had the advantage of knowing it was compact. So I was looking to how to prove it. So then I sort of thought, okay, let's think about zero. Okay, zero has to be in some open set in the cover because it's an open cover, okay? And that set that zero is in is gonna solve everything. And this is why, and it's so cool. And you already see the argument very soon. We have zero. Now, it doesn't matter. There's some open set containing zero in the cover. It doesn't matter how small it is. It's just gonna contain, it's just gonna contain uh, zero and it's gonna contain some epsilon neighborhood of zero, okay? There's gonna be some epsilon so that minus epsilon comma plus epsilon is going to be in that open set in the cover. So we can write it out as minus epsilon epsilon, it's going to be in that open set in the cover. And what's really cool is that this single open set containing zero is gonna take care of almost all the elements of our set S. What I mean by that is eventually, because one over N, the sequence one over N converges to zero, gets closer and closer to zero as N goes to infinity, it approaches zero. What we know is eventually, it doesn't matter how small epsilon is, there's going to be a one over big N that's going to be inside my open set containing zero. Okay, I said there's some open set in my cover containing zero. Um, there's going to be a large enough n so that one over n is going to be in that and everything beyond also. And then it's so cool because then if you look at the numbers before one over n, one over n minus one, one over n minus two, all the way up to one over three, one half one or whatever, there's only a finite number of them. And each of them is going to be in an open set in the cover. So in this way, we've, you've chosen one open set containing zero, and then you only needed a finite number more to take care of everything. And the way we'd rigorously write this out is we just say, okay, let u alpha, let zero be in u alpha one, okay, for some alpha one in, in A, right? And we know that because u alpha one is open, so since u alpha one is open, we know that minus epsilon epsilon is contained in u alpha one, for some epsilon greater than zero. So I'm just writing out the rigorous proof because I wanna show you how to do that very rigorously if you're still getting used to this stuff um, because it does seem very intimidating at the beginning. But I wanna show you the idea as well. So 
we know that u alpha 1 is open, and so there's some epsilon greater than 0. And then we know that, so that minus epsilon epsilon is contained in u alpha 1. Since 1 over n converges to 0, right, we know that there exists a big N. So I could say there exists a big N. So I'm going to write it as there exists big N such that, such that the following is true, such that 1 over N is in minus epsilon epsilon, right? It's going to be, I mean, it's a positive number. So it's going to be less than epsilon for all n, little n greater than big N. So for all little n greater than big N. Um, and now we can, we can do the following thing. So let um, 1 over i be in u alpha i for, so I'm going to say maybe, um, I'll not call that u alpha 1. I could maybe call that, um, maybe I'll call that u beta. Okay, just, I'm just showing you like sometimes when you write proofs as well, I'm just trying to also show you now. I mean, retrospectively, I'd realize I should change the notation. So I'm just going to do it this, and I'll explain why. I'm going to call u alpha 1 something else. So I'm going to say u beta for some beta. And then I'm going to say that 1 over i being u alpha i for 1 less than or equal to i less than big N. Okay? And now what we see is that this, this u alpha i takes care of all the numbers, the finite number of numbers of the form 1 over little n before 1 over big N. Okay, and then what we can do is we can, take, we can take care of all the numbers afterwards, infinitely many of them. We can take care of them with just our single open set containing u, which was 0, which was u beta. And so therefore, um, u beta, um, u alpha 1, dot, 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 u alpha n minus 1 is our finite subcover. Okay, is a finite subcover. Okay, so I'm not going to actually write it out. Just say that is a finite subcover. And that's going to be our proof that this is set is compact. And if you're loving my content, as I said, please don't forget to leave a like and subscribe. Share it with people. It makes a huge difference to my channel. And if you're really loving my content, also please consider supporting my channel on Patreon or joining as a YouTube channel member, whichever you prefer. It makes a huge difference. There are exclusive perks that you can check out on the links in the description down below. And a huge thank you to Alex and Nathan for their ongoing support. Now the next step is to understand compactness deeply is to prove that every closed interval is compact. Using the definition that every open cover has a finite subcover. I've done a video on it. I've also reviewed compactness at the beginning. You could rewatch that or you could skip slightly ahead to the actual proof. Check it out, it's gonna pop up on the screen here. And another fun video you're gonna love is the proof that an increasing function from R to R has to actually be continuous almost everywhere. But why? Why is the proof? How does that work? You can check it out here. It's a very popular video on my channel. Hope you have an amazing day. I wish you all the best and I'm super excited to see you in the next video.